Warhammer 40k is by far one of the most bombastic, brutal, and over-the-top universes ever created, and its lore is full of some super scary doomsday weapons that not enough people know about. So join me today as we deep dive 10 of the most powerful weapons that exist in the grim dark future. We're going to be talking about a handheld weapon that not only destroys both a person's physical body and soul, but also actually retcons them out of existence. An ancient alien trebuchet that is capable of throwing asteroids all the way across the galaxy at speeds multiple times faster than the speed of light. And finally, a terrifying construct created by the Catan that not only has the power to create entire star systems, but if used improperly, can destroy everything that has ever or will ever exist. We're gonna be talking about all that and a whole lot more, but first a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grimdark. Empires and Puzzles is not only an amazing award-winning free-to-play mobile title, but also one of the most unique matchups of match three puzzle and RPG mechanics I've ever seen. It mixes elements from both of these super popular genres into an easy to pick up but difficult to master experience, wherein all you have to do is match shields of the same color in order to attack, and you can do even more damage by timing your specials perfectly. In Empires and Puzzles, you'll end up traveling to faraway lands such as the mystical seas of Atlantis and face off against the realm gods in Valhalla and even the tombs of ancient Egypt. You can collect over 400 collectible heroes based around the different elements, with new heroes being introduced each and every month. You can train up your heroes and build up their talent trees to upgrade and power up your team Team, and with every victory, your spoils grow. You can use them to expand your empire by leveling up food and iron production, as well as craft useful battle items, train your troops, or even summon in more heroes. If you think you've got what it takes, you can attempt to reach the top of the global PvP leaderboards and also join an alliance to raid other alliances in PvP for some truly amazing rewards. At its core, Empires and Puzzles is a social game, so by inviting your friends to play with you, once they reach level 10, you'll both receive some awesome rewards. From June 12th until July 16th, the game is going to be having a huge beach party event, featuring 10 brand new heroes with a summer theme, as well as exclusive event stages and some new power-ups. You can download the game for free on Android and iOS by clicking on the link in the description of this video. Big thanks to Empires and Puzzles for sponsoring this video. Number 10, the Retcon Gun. The first weapon that we're gonna talk about on this list is admittedly a pretty weird one. It may not have the planet cracking, solar system destroying, and galaxy sundering raw power of some of the weapons that will be featured later on in this video, but when I first found out about it, which admittedly was relatively recently, it absolutely had to make the cut. It's often referred to in the community as the ontological gun, a reference to ontology, which in metaphysics is the philosophical study of being closely related to concepts such as existence, becoming, and reality, which in fairness makes a lot of sense for what this thing is, but I personally have a much more, in my opinion, hilariously accurate name for it, the retcon gun, because that's literally what it does, so I'm going to be calling it that for the rest of this segment. We don't know what the real name of the retcon gun is or its origins, other than it is a product created by humans within the dark age of technology. At first glance, the weapon appears to be pretty similar to many of the other molecular disruption weapons that exist within the grimdark future, as it seems just about every major sentient species has some kind of variant on this class of firearm. When the weapon is used, the retcon gun tears apart matter at the molecular level, causing any living thing hit by it to be retconned out of reality. And I don't just mean that in a fun way of saying that when you get shot by this thing, you evaporate. I mean, literally, every molecule in your body, every ectoplasmic piece of your soul, every moment in time that you have ever existed, and every memory of you in every living soul that you have ever interacted with is utterly and thoroughly ripped out of the timeline. It's as if you quite literally were retconned out of existence. How the idea for such a horrifying weapon was ever conceived, let alone how this thing was created, is a truly disturbing mystery. Many would doubt that such a thing even exists, but we get a pretty good look at one in Lionel Johnson's Primark novel, Lord of the First. He braced the weight of his gun and targeted the tidal surge of infected crewmen rushing up from the storage bay towards him. He pulled the trigger. A spray of explosive psychoactive rounds incinerated the tightly packed mortals, body and soul, each individual screaming into a pyre that burned across two realms. Our event counted 25 men, armed with stub pistols and wrenches. A second after he had counted them, they were gone. Every ripple and echo that suggested that they had ever existed eradicated. And even Arvon's eidetic recall struggled to conjure any details of their appearance, except that there had been 25 armed with stub pistols and wrenches. An itch walked up his spine, and in spite of his discipline, Arvon struggled to suppress a shudder as he lowered the weapon and continued his advance. The crazy thing to remember about this encounter is that these were crewmen aboard his ship, 
They had been possessed by a Xenos race known as the Carve, but despite that, this Space Marine knew who they were. They may have just been mortal crewmen, but a Space Marine's memory is absolutely ridiculous. After they disappeared, his Super Astartes brain failed to conjure any memory of them. Can you imagine how much damage an army equipped with guns like this could do? And not in terms of just conquering territory, but in terms of thoroughly destroying huge swaths of time. If these things were made on mass, or worse, scaled up into much larger and more powerful variants and mounted on the fleets of battleships, the destruction of reality doesn't even really come close to really explain what would happen. There are some things that we as human beings struggle to comprehend. We can imagine guns that liquefy people. We can imagine things that explode planets, even weapons that launch black holes, destroying entire systems. Hell, we can conceive of guns that can destroy entire galaxies. Admittedly, even though we can wrap our mind around it, the logistics of something like that are quite literally incomprehensible. But regardless, the idea makes sense. Guns that alter timelines and erase history with every shot is something, I'm gonna be honest with you, I struggle to even comprehend just what that looks like or what kind of damage that would really do. In my research, I've stumbled across a lot of people talking about this weapon, and many seem to think that it's one of the Adrathic weapons utilized by the Custodians. Ancient Dark Age of Technology weapons that were said to be so valuable and destructive, and above all else, coveted by mortals, that the Emperor forbid anyone other than him or his Custodians could have one. Now, during the Age of Strife, many wars were fought over them by the techno-barbarian Lords of Terra. But after the Emperor came to power, he demanded all of them be turned over. The punishment for refusing to do so was severe. Death. Not just for the individual, but also for their entire family, their neighbors, their neighbor's family, everyone in the city they lived in. Hell, the lore actually says that it was every single living person within that nation that would be condemned to death. The Emperor was that afraid of somebody else having access to this technology. That being said, when you read what these weapons actually do, they're certainly super scary, powerful, monomolecular disruption weapons, but they're not ripping people out of the timeline. Personally, I don't think these are the same guns. The retcon gun is in a class all of its own, and hopefully this is the only one left in existence. Whereas the retcon gun is certainly one of the most esoteric and powerful creations of mankind, some of the other species out there are capable of making things way crazier, like the next entry on this list. Number nine. The Aeonic Orb. Ah, Necron technology. Simple in concept, impossible in its design, and a sheer testament to the overwhelming bombacity of 40K's lore. A fair warning, there's gonna be a good chunk of Necron Doomsday weapons on here, considering that impossibly advanced ancient technology that defies the known laws of the universe is kind of their thing. And the Aeonic Orb is a pristine example of Necron ingenuity. You see, this thing is basically a containment sphere that houses within it the power of an entire sun. These things were said to have been created by the Catan during the War in Heaven, and even back then, they were pretty difficult to create. They are incredibly rare and have only been documented a couple of times. The sphere itself is mounted on a big hovering platform so it can be used as a war engine and can be fired in a few different ways. In both cases, the protective sphere is open to release the destructive energy of the ancient stars contained within it. It can be utilized in such a way that it creates a wide area of effect to bombard advancing armies with a ludicrous amount of solar radiation, instantly cutting down an entire force in the blink of an eye. The more potent version of its attacks, however, is when the energy is concentrated into the equivalent of a vicious solar flare. This attack is said to be strong enough to obliterate any material the energy comes into contact with. If the containment field ends up suffering a catastrophic failure, then all of that stored energy will be released, causing a massive explosion that will level not just all of the enemy forces in a huge area, but also all of the Necrons that were utilizing the device as well. The Necrons don't really see this as a bad thing though, as on one hand, it serves as a demonstration of what they're truly capable of and on the other, it keeps the device from falling into enemy hands. Using the captured power of an ancient star to obliterate your enemies is certainly pretty crazy, but it's not quite as crazy as the next entry on this list. Number eight, the Sperenza's Black Hole Cannon. The Sperenza was a ship from the Priest of Mars trilogy and is one of, if not potentially, the largest ships ever created by mankind. It was described as being the size of a continent, complete with the infrastructure and industry of an entire hive, full of manufactories, refineries, crackling power banks, and gene bays. Its engines were said to be larger than most other starships, and each of its hundreds of void generators and Gellera rays were large enough to shroud an entire frigate by themselves. This thing was so massive that its mass and density created a distorted gravity field equivalent to that of an unstable moon. Although it's designated as an Arc Mechanicus vessel, 
it was not originally created by the Mechanicus. They actually discovered it by accident on the forge world of Palomar. When it was unearthed, the ship was discovered to only be halfway through its construction. Thus, the Mechanicus immediately set to work to complete the ancient vessel. And when it was finally turned on, its machine spirit proved to be so unbelievably powerful that it unleashed a burst scream that destroyed the entire world in a radioactive hellstorm. More so, the machine spirit was able to absorb the machine spirits of every single machine that was destroyed in the explosion, becoming a hyper-advanced gestalt entity. What makes the ship so particularly interesting to the community is its largest and most powerful weapon, which was a device that was capable of not only manipulating time, but also creating black holes. In the novel Priests of Mars, when it's first fired at a group of Eldari ships, it generates a powerful black hole that crushes everything caught in its blast. What's particularly impressive about this is the black hole actually missed. The Eldar ships that it was firing at were cloaked and were incredibly nimble and able to dodge out of the way. However, they ended up getting caught in its AoE secondary effect that displaced them in the timeline moving them backwards seconds before they had enacted their evasion protocols. A ship like this suddenly being wrenched back and forth through time caused an enormous amount of damage to it, and with it critically wounded and its cloaking capabilities disabled, the fleet that had been accompanying the Sporenza launched an all-out attack, volley after volley of torpedoes that destroyed it in a spectacular fashion. This thing is undoubtedly powerful, and it's no wonder that it's a fan-favorite ship, but when trying to be objective and measure its actual power, we have to use what's been written about it. And in this particular situation, the gun missed, so we didn't really get to see exactly what taking a black hole to the face would do. However, the next weapon that we're going to talk about really couldn't care less if it's on target or not, as if you're within a couple thousand kilometers of it when it goes off, you're probably going to be dead. Number 7. The Nova Cannon The Nova Cannons are massive weapons designed to be used exclusively by the battleships of the Imperial Navy, and they're normally mounted on their prow. This is done so the ship's engine can compensate for the enormous amount of recoil generated by the gun. It uses graviometric impellers to accelerate a projectile to a fraction of the speed of light, which in turn implodes at a preset distance after firing, exerting massive amounts of destructive gravitational force on everything caught in the blast radius. The actual projectile that is fired isn't armed until a fraction of a second after it leaves the ship. This gives it enough time to have moved tens of thousands of kilometers away, thus significantly reducing the risk of using such a deadly weapon. The Nova Cannon is capable of delivering widespread destruction in an area of thousands of kilometers, with a practical range of at least 321,000 kilometers, as demonstrated in the novel Dawn of Fire, Avenging Sun. The force a Nova Cannon can generate is said to be more potent than a dozen plasma bombs, and although implosion-based ammunition is most commonly used with them, there are variants of Nova Cannon that can fire plasma-based warheads, said to burn with the fury of a small star. Whatever ammunition they use, all Nova Cannons are capable of enormous amounts of destruction, with the potential of eliminating an entire enemy fleet in a single shot. For how powerful they are, they do have a few drawbacks. First and foremost, during the Grand Crusade, they were considered to be experimental and prone to failures, although they did end up seeing a good amount of use during the Horus Heresy. The weapon is unstable, inaccurate, and requires a remarkably stable weapon platform to even be considered for mounting, not to mention it's practically useless at close range. Thus, many Imperial Navy captains prefer utilizing more traditional torpedoes. Despite these drawbacks, the Nova Cannon is rightfully feared as one of the most powerful weapons at the Imperium's disposal. When it comes to weapons of mass destruction within humanity, the Nova Cannon might be incredibly powerful, but it is not nearly as infamous as the next entry on this list. Number 6. Exterminatus For an Inquisitor to initiate the Exterminatus of a world is to condemn billions to death. It is something that is only done in the most extreme of circumstances, when a world is considered to be so far gone that saving it or purifying the corruption that has been allowed to fester on its surface is deemed not only an impossible task, but one that if allowed to continue could spread to other planets throughout the system. Many people who are new to Warhammer 40k tend to ask why Exterminatus isn't used more frequently, as it seems like a pretty good tool for bringing the Emperor's divine wrath against the heretics. The reality is that planets are incredibly valuable, and 9 times out of 10, its complete and utter annihilation is seen as a grievous waste. During the days of the Great Crusade, and even now in the 42nd millennium, the Imperium would much rather capture a planet and thus gain control of all of its resources, rather than making it completely uninhabitable. There are, however, times when such a positive outcome is simply not on the table. 
Exterminatus can only be ordered by those with extreme authority, such as an Inquisitor, a Space Marine Chapter Master, a Lord High Admiral, or a Lord Commander. And they all have different methods of doing this. There is no singular Exterminatus gun. Some forms of Exterminatus include that of the Cyclonic Torpedoes, which scour a world's surface with nucleonic fire or raw plasma, which subsequently burns away a planet's atmosphere in a storm of fire that causes its oceans to boil to vapor and the surface to be left as barren rock. There is also the Mortalis atmospheric missiles that cover the entire surface of a world in an irradiated firestorm of one of the most dreaded weapons ever created, Phosphex, 40K's equivalent of Super Napalm, an extremely deadly and terrifying incinerary weapon viewed even by the Imperium to be considered a war crime even when only used as a traditional hand flamer, let alone something capable of consuming an entire world. Phosphex residue is incredibly radioactive, thus once its flames finally die out, the planet will be rendered completely uninhabitable. Then finally there's the terrifying virus bombs, which contain within them the dreaded life eater virus. Once unleashed, the virus clouds are capable of quickly spreading across the entire surface of a planet in minutes. The particles are so tiny that they can penetrate power armor and rebreathers. Whatever organic creature comes into contact with the virus will quickly begin to rot and break down into sludge plants, animals, or people, everything immediately begins to decay. The scariest part about this is that if someone was able to survive this initial virus wave, they won't last much longer, as the breakdown of all of that organic matter on a planet all at once releases an inconceivable amount of flammable gas into the atmosphere, which will eventually ignite on its own, or one of the ships in orbit will set it off with an incendiary device. Once that spark goes off, the gas will combust into a voracious firestorm that sears everything on the planet's surface to bare rock, as well as burning away all of its oxygen. In the 42nd millennium, cyclonic torpedoes are by far the most common form of exterminatus, but the other two I mentioned do still pop up in the lore from time to time, especially if you're reading about the Horus Heresy. Whatever form it takes, exterminatus very seldomly leaves behind any survivors, and is only done in the most extreme of circumstances. There's a great quote from an Inquisitor talking about Exterminatus that I want to share for you, as it's probably the most 40k thing I've ever heard. Some may question your right to destroy 10 billion people. Those who understand know that you have no right to let them live. Whereas Exterminatus is rightfully feared for its ability to kill every living thing on a planet, the next thing we're going to talk about can kill the planet itself. Number 5. The Armageddon Gun of the Planet Killer Although its name is pretty self-explanatory, the ship known as the Planet Killer is anything but ordinary. The ship is absolutely bristling with long-range lances, weapon batteries, and torpedo launchers, but its real claim to fame is its main weapon known as the Armageddon Gun, so named for its ability to single-handedly bring death to a planet. This energy cannon of immeasurable magnitude is impossibly powerful and is capable of outputting a beam of ludicrously destructive energy that can be sustained for over half an hour. The concentrating plasma sears through miles of planetary crust right into the world's mantle, gouging out a continent-sized wound. A planet hit by an attack from this thing is thrown out of its natural orbit, causing it to flip on its axis and eventually collapse into itself. The first time we ever saw this thing was in the original Battlefleet Gothic tabletop game. Its original description said that the Imperium had no idea how Abaddon was capable of constructing such a vessel. Everything about it just didn't make sense. It didn't match any known patterns of ships, and based on its construction, could only logically have been created within the Eye of Terror. However, in the 8th edition Chaos Space Marine Codex, we learn that Abaddon discovered an ancient shipyard drifting through the warp, and amongst its rusting gantries and crumbling manufactorum towers, he discovered a half-constructed vessel that was as vast in scale as it was terrible in design. He was awestruck by its dark majesty and immediately set his warpsmiths to the task of completing it. For a time, this would become Abaddon's flagship during the Gothic War, and was responsible for the destruction of Savavan, where its fearsome weaponry burned the sky and split continents apart, killing 14 billion people within an hour. There was another instance where he used it to destroy the three moons of the planet Stranivar. The moons were blasted apart, and the resulting debris rained down on the planet in an apocalyptic storm that obliterated everything on its surface. Although the ship was believed to have been destroyed, it would make one brief appearance in Imperial Nihilus in the 8th edition campaign supplement Vigilus Ablaze. The lore unfortunately goes dark after this, and the current whereabouts of the planet killer are unknown. 
Not to take anything away from the Planet Killer, as being able to destroy an entire world with 30 minutes of continuous fire is certainly an impressive feat. But the next thing we're going to talk about can kill a world instantaneously from multiple light years away. Number 4. The Gravitic Trebuchet The Gravitic Trebuchet was a weapon featured in the novel The Twice Dead King, Rain, described as a Necron superweapon from the days of the War in Heaven that was commissioned by an ancient pharaoh of the Mephrit dynasty. It was a defensive engine that was designed to accelerate asteroids at superluminal speed and was capable of annihilating the most fiercely fortified targets from light years away. At some point during the War in Heaven, the pharaoh that owned the device was slain along with its keepers, and thus the weapon fell into dormancy. But one of the Necrons in the story claims that he remembers its location, as it was his void mines that were used to detonate the asteroids in order to gather the materials needed to create the device. It's neither here nor there, but I thought it was funny. The only reason this device is even mentioned in this book is that the Necrons are currently being pursued by a group of space marines, and despite their superior technology, they don't have the resources to outrun them forever, and they know they will eventually be destroyed. In super pretentious and dismissive Necron fashion, Altex, the main character of the story, hears about this equivalent of a god weapon and basically shrugs it off, saying that yeah, that would be super cool and all if I was annoyed by some frivolous target multiple light years away from here, but I'm not. I have space marines directly behind my fleet. The cryptic who tells him about this says that he failed to explain what he really meant. If they could get to the device, they could use their own ships as ammunition in order to instantaneously escape. It's a terrible idea, but they don't really have a lot of options. I won't go into spoilers for this book, as quite frankly, it's the best Necron book ever written, even more so than The Infinite and the Divine. I really want to take a minute to examine just how powerful this thing is. But before I try to get into it, I'm no physicist, as many of you know, and math is definitely not my strong suit. But I'm aware from having read things on the internet that the only thing that can travel the speed of light is stuff that doesn't have mass. For anything that does have mass, it's an impossibility as far as we know. But we're dealing with Warhammer 40k and space magic and all kinds of wacky stuff. If an asteroid was to strike the planet traveling even nearly the speed of light, the devastation would be absolutely unthinkable. So much so that no computer exists today that can accurately simulate what it would look like if it was going even faster. To put things in perspective, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs millions of years ago was believed to have been traveling at speeds of around 19 to 27 kilometers per second. The speed of light, however, is 300,000 kilometers per second. If something just 1% of the speed of light impacted the Earth, the devastation would be far greater. The crater it left would be enormous, and the resulting dust cloud would choke all life on the planet, killing untold billions of living creatures. At 10% of the speed of light, it would wound the Earth so severely that the mantle would crack open and flood the surface with magma, turning the Earth into a giant fireball. If something traveling 99.999999999% the speed of light hit the Earth, it would travel clean through to the core. This would generate an expanding cloud of plasma and radiation around the entry point that rips outward through the body of the planet, the entire backside of the planet expanding outward in an incandescent cloud. The meteor, as well as all of the particles it generated, would rip through the body of the planet, superheating it to the point that it glows brighter than the sun. The momentum would be so unconceivably great that it would send the Earth spiraling out of orbit. But that's little to no consequence at this point, as the Earth doesn't exist anymore. The energy deposited is 10,000 times greater than the planet's gravitational binding energy, and everything that ever was of the Earth is blown into an expanding cloud of plasma out into space, causing the Sun to emit massive solar flares as it absorbs the waves of dust, and Mars and Venus are completely scoured clean by the waves of incredibly high-energy plasma. And again, that's only traveling nearly the speed of light. Something moving superluminally, as in multiple times the speed of light, is so impossible based on what we know of physics that we have no way of knowing what that would actually look like. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that it would be really, really bad. It's probably a good thing that the one in the story ends up getting destroyed, but doomsday weapons like this were commonplace during the War in Heaven, and it's very possible that another gravitic trebuchet still exists somewhere out there. This thing without a doubt is one of the most powerful weapons to have ever existed in the grimdark future, but at the end of the day, we've never actually seen it used in the lore. We just know that it exists and kind of have to take the Necrons at their word. However, the next entry on this list, without a doubt, has demonstrated the ability to kill entire star systems. Number 3. The Warp Cannons of a Blackstone Fortress The legendary Blackstone Fortresses are a vast and dark construct of unknown origin, created with a technological mastery possessed by none of the sentient races alive today. 
But who built the Blackstone Fortresses and for what purpose is unknown, though rumors abound that they were a creation of the Old Ones or possibly even the Necrons during the War in Heaven. When brought online, the capabilities of a Blackstone Fortress are almost unbelievable. They're able to travel through the Void with no obvious means of propulsion and seem to be able to ignore the laws of inertia. They are heavily shielded and armored, more so than even the sturdiest of battleships, and their weaponry is capable of harnessing the powers of the warp into a devastating offense. Although many of them have been claimed by the Imperium and the forces of chaos over the millennia, it was only Abaddon the Despoiler who was able to unlock their potential and use them the way they were intended to, whereas the ones controlled by the Imperium were just repurposed into space stations. It was the destructive capabilities of a Blackstone Fortress that was responsible for the splitting of the galaxy in half when Abaddon threw one that had been disabled like a meteor at the fortress world of Cadia. There was enough lore on these things to fill an entire dedicated video and then some. So for the sake of keeping this simple, as this is just supposed to be a top 10 list, we're gonna focus on its most powerful weapon. The main gun they are equipped with is known as a warp cannon, a device capable of ripping a hole in the fabric of reality, ushering forth the deadly energies of the warp. The gun was said to be powerful enough to destroy planets outright, let alone rip apart enemy fleets. At one point, the despoiler attacked the Tarantis system on the edge of the Gothic sector. He used three of the Blackstone Fortresses, as well as his accompanying Chaos Fleet to sweep aside the few Imperial ships that were close to where they broke from the warp. Imperial ships from the surrounding area moved to intercept, but Abaddon's fleet engaged them, buying enough time for the Blackstone Fortresses to move into position. They combined the power of all three of them into a single massive energy wave targeted at Tarantus's star. With their objective complete, the Chaos ships and the Blackstone Fortresses retreated and jumped back into the warp. Now, the effects of the attack weren't immediately noticeable until the star began to rage and boil. For an entire month, it emitted tortured storms that moved across its surface as its corona expanded to engulf the two nearest worlds. Many would attempt to flee the system, but the complete evacuation of three worlds in such a short period of time proved to be an impossible task. Four weeks after the attack, Tarantus' star went supernova, destroying everything in thousands of billions of miles in every direction in a storm of gas and plasma. The entire star system was destroyed. Fun fact about these things, when the Blackstone Fortresses were originally introduced to the Battlefleet Gothic tabletop game, the designers said that they were leaving, and I shit you not, this is what it was actually called, the super mega death shot out of the rules. As they had no idea how to even begin to calculate what three Blackstone Fortresses would be capable of in the tabletop game. They did eventually come out with rules for it where it did an enormous amount of damage and extended the range and damage based on the more Blackstone Fortresses you were using in the combined attack but I always just thought it was really funny that the designers were just sitting there scratching their heads like, yeah, we have no idea what to do with this. It's too powerful. The Blackstone Fortresses are one of the coolest things in all of 40K, and I'll do more in-depth coverage on them in the future. But even as powerful as three of them combined is, they're nothing compared to the next thing on this list. Number two, the Celestial Orrery. I feel like every single time I talk about the Necrons, somehow the conversation always leads back to the Celestial Ori. So since I've covered this thing pretty extensively in the past, I'm going to keep it brief, as I know exactly what will happen in the comment section if I don't at least mention this thing, and needless to say, it, it won't go well for me. But in a twist, I've recently been reading about a device that I think may be even more powerful, but we'll get to that in a minute. At its core, the Celestial Orrery is a giant holographic map of the known galaxy that updates in real time. It's controlled by a single Necron dynasty known as the Oriskar dynasty, who has completely dedicated themselves to its protection. And that's because this thing isn't just a big fancy map. It's plugged into the universe so mysteriously and completely that if somebody using the device wished, they could tap on one of the countless stars represented in its holographic matrix and cause the corresponding star in real space to supernova condemning the untold billions living within its system to a fiery demise. Doing such a thing is a decision not to be taken lightly, as the ramification on future events are unquantifiable. Every time it's used, the timeline fundamentally alters, causing an enormous amount of damage in the fabric of reality, as well as creating chains of critical reactions. The Necrons who guard the Orrery understand enough to know that this thing should never be used in such a way, except for in the most dire of circumstances, not even the preservation of their own species is something that necessarily warrants the Orrery's power. They primarily use the device only for scrying purposes or to trim and pluck certain undesirable elements out of the galaxy. 
Now, considering they allow chaos to continue to exist and have not interfered in the countless genocidal campaigns of the lesser races, we can only imagine what horrifying entities or abnormalities they consider worthy of pruning. They view themselves as gardeners of creation and treat the Milky Way like a giant bonsai tree. And even though this thing is truly a terrifying construct, perhaps we should be thankful that it exists and such a level-headed group of individuals is controlling it. If it was ever to fall into the wrong hands, be those hands Chaos, Human, Orc, Eldar, or even a more vengeful group of Necrons, the resulting destruction to the galaxy would be unthinkable. But despite everything I just told you, there is still something else in Warhammer that is even more powerful. Number one, the Breath of the Gods. In the 38th millennium, there was a radical magos of the Adeptus Mechanicus known as Telok. He had heard legends of an ancient god machine that had the ability to fundamentally alter the fabric of reality, a creation that could birth entirely new solar systems. He would end up launching a crusade to find the device, but eventually all communication with his fleet ceased. The magos was believed to have been killed and to have never have actually found it. However, that would prove not to be the case, as he did in fact discover the engine, and in researching it, he would begin to descend into madness. Word was eventually received many centuries later that he had in fact succeeded, and a new crusade was launched to find him and this legendary device. You see, the Breath of the Gods was a Catan device developed during the War in Heaven, built around a captured Catan shard that had the disturbing ability to drain power from not just the stars in the current day, but also siphon it from stars in the future in the past as well, draining dozens of them simultaneously. It could use this harnessed power to accomplish staggering feats of temporal engineering that defied all known laws of the universe. Not only did it exist as an unlimited source of energy, but that energy could be used to create new stars, planetary systems, and potentially at its most powerful, even other galaxies. Although never intended to be used in such a way, its power was so complete that if used as a weapon and pushed to its extremes, its destructive power was simply on an incomprehensible scale. The consequences for its use were incredibly severe. All manner of spatial anomalies would begin to open up, stars would die before their time, and others would fail to ignite. The amount of damage somebody could do by causing a star to supernova millions of years before its time, whether in the past or the future, is kind of hard to even imagine. It's believed that the device was responsible for the creation of the Halo Scar, a benighted and mysterious region of space that swallowed up any ships that dared to venture into its depths. This was an engine created for beings that were anathema to life by a servitor race compelled to feed their monstrous appetite. The Catan were known to be gluttonous gods that fed upon stars, and thus the breath of the gods would have streamlined this process for them, allowing them to consume at a much faster rate. This was a machine that violated the laws of space-time in unspeakable ways and defied everything we know of reality. Through the use of the machine, the Mad Magos was able to bring life to an entire star system and even create the Forge World of Ex Nihilo. At one point in the story, we get to see just how destructive this thing can be, as its misuse causes the Forge World it is on to begin to tear itself apart, a black hole forming in its place. An Eldar in the story sees all of the different skeins of the future collapsing into this temporal anomaly, and then she has a vision of what is to come. A shadow rose up to envelop Balana, shockingly sudden and suffocatingly intense in its darkness, like a veil of black velvet had been drawn across her skein. She saw the sky blacken as the terminus of every thread came into view, unraveling toward extinction with horrifying speed. The end of all things. An impossible boundary and what should be infinite space. Belana gasped, her chest constricting at the sight. This was the doom she had seen ensconced within the Sperenza. Space and time were coming undone, ripping apart like the solar sails of a wounded race ship. Doom had come to this world, but that was the least of the danger. The rift beginning here was pulling wider with every passing second, drawing every thread within the skein to it. Like a weaver's shuttle reversing through the warp and weft of a loom, the future was unraveling to its omega point. Exnilio was becoming the temporal equivalent of a black hole, a howling abyss in which no time would ever exist again. Its effects were yet confined to the depths of the planet, but Bellana felt the catastrophic geomantic damage that the Hrud had wreaked racing to the surface. The physical death of Exnilio was nothing, but the temporal shockwaves would spread into the galactic void of space, reaching into the galaxy of Bellana's kin. It would be a slow death for the galaxy, as all time was devoured by the rift, torn by the Ingear's device. But that it would end all things forevermore was certain. The Mad Magos believes that with the power of this device, he has in fact become a god, that he should be the rightful ruler of the Imperium, and he would use the breath of the gods to destroy Terra and Mars. 
and thankfully by the end of the story, the machine and the surrounding system it is in end up getting destroyed. All of the captured energy that it had stolen reverts back to its point of origin, stars that had been completely drained of life, burning once again with newfound vigor. And much like the Celestial Ori, it was never intended to be used by creatures that had such a linear grasp of the temporal flow, and no ability to perceive what is referenced in the book as deep time. It's important to remember that when we see it in this story, it's not a Catan that is powering it, or at the very least, it's a very weak and dying shard of one. But the Magos had learned that the entropic fields generated by the species known as the Harad could also be used to power it. The results were remarkable, but only a fraction of what it was truly capable of. As the most horrifying thing of all was that Talok believed the legends that the Dragon of Mars was actually a living Catan, or at least a considerably powerful shard of one. His ultimate goal was to go back to Mars, enter the Noctis Labyrintha, and slap the Void Dragon inside of this thing, increasing its ludicrous capabilities to a simply unimaginable level. With all of the weapons that we talked about today, there's a couple of things to bear in mind about how I rank them. The first is the purpose of each of these different things was built for something else. Something like the retcon gun is incredibly powerful, but considering it's something that can be wielded by infantry and the only example we have of one being used was to kill a bunch of random crewmen, we have to put its full potential within the realm of speculation. And even still, although the technology is incredibly dangerous, the weapon itself potentially doesn't have the capability of destroying an entire planet or fleet of warships. In the next category up, we have things that are capable of destroying starships, like the Nova Cannon or the Black Hole Launching Cannon of the Sparenza. After that, we have Exterminatus-class weaponry that is capable of purging all life from a world, but not outright destroying it. However, I will point out real quick that the Night Hunter Conrad Kurz did destroy his planet of Nostromo by literally breaking it apart. This was done with Exterminatus-class orbital bombardment, focused on a very specific weak point in the planet's crust, believed to originate from the impact site where Conrad originally landed on the planet, which was then further exacerbated by Nostromo's intense adamantium mining operations. So yes, orbital bombardment was used to destroy a world, but this isn't normally how it goes and it was kind of a special situation. For more reliable world cracking, we have to go further up the power scale to things like the Planet Killer, which is able to detonate a planet single-handedly with its Armageddon gun, whereas the Blackstone Fortresses can kill an entire star system. The Warhammer community likes to point to the Celestial Orrery as being the most powerful weapon to have ever existed, and although there is some truth to that, there are a few things to bear in mind. In its current state, it's not considered a weapon at all. It's a scrying device. We have no evidence of it being used as a weapon other than the fact that the lore tells us that it definitely can be. And while the Oriskar dynasty continues to exist, we probably will never see that happen. With the Breath of the Gods, on the other hand, we have an entire novel that explores what it is truly capable of, whereas the Celestial Orrery just kind of exists as a bit of background fluff in the Necron Codexes. When directly comparing the two, the Celestial Ori is capable of causing a whole bunch of supernovas across the galaxy, whereas the Breath of the Gods can simply erase the galaxy from the timeline. It's difficult to wrap our heads around what that even means, but it's certainly more powerful than the Ori if we're trying to directly compare the two at their most powerful. Which one of the weapons that we talked about today was your favorite and why? Which one do you think is the most terrifying? What are some other of your favorite weapons from Warhammer 40k? And also, what are some other things that you'd love to hear me talk about in a video? I'm always on the lookout for new ideas for videos from you guys in the comment section, and I try to respond to as many of them as I can. Anyways, that's all I had to say about super mega doomsday weapons today, so big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.